Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Luke. It's also found in Matthew chapter 9 and Mark chapter 2. Uh, but we're going to focus on the Luke passage today, but we'll be referring to the uh, others also. One day as he was teaching, <clears throat> Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. This is the word of God for us today. And Father, we do pray that you would help us to understand the truth of your word and apply your truth to our lives. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let me begin with a story. You expect me to anyway. <clears throat> As you know, um, hospital regulations require that a wheelchair for patients uh, being discharged is used to take people out of the hospital. One student uh, nurse tells the story of arriving at a hospital room to transport a discharged patient. And when she arrived, uh, she found an el elderly gentleman already dressed and sitting on the bed with a suitcase at his feet. The elderly gentleman insisted he did not need the nurse's help to leave the hospital. But after a chat about rules being rules and how everybody had to obey them, the elderly gentleman reluctantly let the nurse wheel him into the elevator. In the elevator, on the way down, the student nurse asked if his wife was going to be meeting him. And the elderly man said, I don't know. She's still upstairs in the bathroom changing out of her hospital gown. <laughs> now, there's a man who knows how to take orders. But let me ask you, how willing are you to follow the orders of others? Obedience is, is often... Uh, something that many of us struggle with. But obedience is a key aspect of learning to follow Christ. Today we're going to wrap up our series on the miracles of Jesus. And the miracles, uh, miracle we're looking at today is one that you're very familiar with. Uh, it, it sort of brings together the teaching and, and the principles of the whole series. Um, when you study the, teaching, the miracles of, of Jesus, you discover a certain pattern that emerges when people came to Jesus and wanted to be healed, he always did the same three things. He would say a word of encouragement to them. He would then diagnose the real problem, and then he would ask them to do something that uh, would cause them to act in faith. Now, a great example of this is our story today about the healing of the paralyzed man. You've heard this story many times. Uh, we, we've told it. Pastor Steve used it as he told his own story uh, and what's important about this story is not so much that the man was healed, but the three things that Jesus uh, said which represent how Jesus heals us. And if you're praying in your own life for a miracle, you're praying for a healing, a, <clears throat> a relationship healing, a, a physical healing, a healing of your emotions, or healing in your uh, finances, you can expect Jesus to do the same three things uh, when you come to him. <clears throat> Number one is this. The first thing Jesus does, Jesus calms my fears. That's the first thing he will do. Matthew 9, 2 says, Some people brought to Jesus a man who was paralyzed and lying on a mat. When Jesus saw the faith of these people, he said to the paralyzed man, Be encouraged, son. Now circle our words, be encouraged. Uh, imagine this scene that we just read about. <clears throat> Jesus had been teaching in a home, and it's packed out. It's SRO, standing room only. And there are four men who think, we've got this friend who is paralyzed, 
if we can just get him to Jesus, we know he will be healed. And when they get there, they can't even get in the door. It's so crowded. So they're pretty creative, a little unorthodox, but uh, they climb up on the roof of this house. And in those days, the roofs, most roofs were flat, uh, and it was pretty easy to take the tiles back. And um, they, they put this man on a stretcher and lowered him right down in front of Jesus. Imagine Jesus. He's teaching, and, uh, and they hear all this noise, and they look up, and all of a sudden, a man is, is coming down through the ceiling, being let down maybe on four ropes on a pallet. Now, imagine that you are this paralyzed person. Uh, how do you think you'd feel? Uh, you think you might be a little self-conscious, uh, maybe a little nervous, a little discouraged. Uh, why in the world would anybody do that? Well, because this guy's desperate. And notice how Jesus reacted. He, he didn't blow him away. You know, he didn't say, hey, you're interrupting my teaching. What are you doing? Um, he didn't get mad at the guy for interrupting. Jesus was never interrupted by seekers. Uh, he always took the time for them, and he loved them. Anybody who, who came honestly to him in faith, it, he, he might have reacted a little differently if somebody's cell phone went off. I don't know, just saying. Um, maybe not. But um, what Jesus says, and I, I love this, the very first thing Jesus says uh, he does is to encourage him. And he says, be encouraged, take heart, uh, cheer up, don't give up, I can help you. He says a word of encouragement. Now, here's the first point. I don't have to be afraid when I come to Jesus about what he'll do when I come to him with a, with a hurt. Now, isn't it funny how most people, when, we, when, when you start talking about God, they kind of get uptight. They say, oh, you know, they get nervous. I mean, I mean you start talking about Jesus, and they say, oh, I, I don't know if I like that or not. Why? Because they don't know how Jesus responds. He always responds in love, not in fear, because as you've heard before, perfect love casts out all fear. And that's the first thing he does. Notice this verse in Hebrews. Jesus is able to understand our weaknesses. When he lived on earth, he was tempted in every way that we are, but he did not sin. When you're hurting, when you're going through a problem, uh, you, you have a tendency to think, you know, nobody understands what I'm going through. Nobody understands. But Jesus does. And in fact, Jesus understands everything you're going through. Um, He's aware of everything you think, you say, uh, everything you say, everything you do, everything you feel, even before you feel it. Uh, look at this verse in Psalm. Oh, Lord, you know everything about me, my every thought. You know what I'm going to say before I even say it. And, and so when, when this guy is being let down, uh, Jesus already knew what the problem was. He, he wasn't uptight about it. And he says, you know, come on down, be encouraged. And, and he knows what your problem is, too. You can come to Jesus without any fear, without any negative reaction. Now, if Jesus already knows everything that you think, everything that you say, everything that you're going to think, he already knows that, then we don't have any reason to, to try and hide what we feel. We should just go ahead and admit our, uh, our feelings to God, tell him exactly what we feel because, well, he already knows anyway. Look at this next verse in 1 Peter. Let Christ have all your worries and cares, for he is always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. Get this point. You might want to write this down. Jesus cares about how I feel. Not, not just your problems. He cares about your feelings. He, he cares about your feelings, whether you're grumpy or whether you're depressed, whatever. Someone asked me if I wake up grumpy in the morning. I said, no, I let her sleep. I uh, Okay, I didn't say who her was, did I? Maybe it was the dog I was talking about. Could have been the dog, yeah. No, but if you're worried, Jesus, Jesus cares about that. If you're lonely, he cares about that. If, if you're uptight, he cares about that. If you're apathetic, he cares about that. He cares about your feelings. Now, why is Jesus' response, his first response when we come to him, to calm our fears? Because that's what keeps us from coming to Christ, our fear. So, so when I feel bad, when I feel guilty... When I feel shame in my life, I have a tendency not to want to go to God. Why? Well, because I'm afraid. I'm afraid first, maybe he'll judge me. Uh, secondly, I'm afraid because I don't deserve to come to him. Uh, I mean, look at all the gross stuff in my life. And, and third, I'm afraid maybe, maybe he doesn't have time. Uh, you know, I'll bother him or something. Uh, and yet Jesus always responds in love. He, he says, hey, be encouraged. Come on down. 
uh, welcome. I've been waiting for you. I know what your problem is already, so come on in. So if you come to Jesus with, with your hurt or your shame or your fear, you're going to receive encouragement, not condemnation. Even if the problem is your own fault. Um, and later we find out that this guy was paralyzed because of his own fault. He was guilty. It, it was guilt that was paralyzing him. But even if the problem is something you brought on yourself, uh, you come to God and you say, God, I made a mess of this. Uh, and he says, I know. Be welcome. Uh, be encouraged. If Jesus were here today, someone, uh, somebody with AIDS came up to him, uh, what do you think his first words would be to them? Oh, you blew it. You brought this on yourself. You made your own bed. Now lie in it. You're reaping what you sowed. Uh, you, you've got to pay the piper. No, I don't think so. I think if somebody with AIDS came to Jesus today, he'd say, be encouraged. I'll help you out. Why? Because God's love for you is not based on your performance. It's unconditional love. It's not based on who you are or what you've done or the fact that your good works are this high or bad works are this low. So he says, okay, come on in. He just loves you. And he, and he takes you just as you are. Now, he loves you too much to let you stay that way. So he goes on to the second step. Jesus cares about your feelings because your feelings are important, and he sympathizes with them, and he understands them, but he doesn't stop there. He takes, it, it takes more than, than a feeling to have a healing. Unfortunately, today, a lot of uh, secular therapy only deals with the feeling level, um, and, and you go to a non-believing counselor, and half the time, they'll just go, well, how do you feel? How do you feel? How do you feel about that? How do you feel? Well, let's work on those feelings. Jesus never stopped there. Uh, he, he always goes beneath the feelings. He sympathizes with the feelings. He understands them. He cares about them. But he says, that's not enough. Now, we've got to get beneath them. Why do you feel the way you do? And so when you come to Jesus needing a miracle, needing a healing, he will first calm your fears and care about your feelings. And then number two, he will gently confront my faults and failures in love. But he will do it. He's going to confront my faults and failures. He goes beneath the symptoms. He goes beneath the surface to the real problems. And one of the things I like about Jesus is that he, he never beats around the bush. He, he never just kind of plays games with you. He tells it like it is. He gets right to the point. And, and in this, this man's situation, since he already knew what the man's problem was, um, he gets right to the issue. And notice what he says. Then Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, wait a minute. Hold it. This, wait, this guy comes to he, for healing, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. That, the guy hadn't asked for forgiveness from sin. Uh, he came to have his paralysis healed. He, he was either a paraplegic or quadriplegic. We don't know. We just know he couldn't walk. Um, and he had to be carried wherever he went. In those days, they didn't have wheelchairs. Uh, he, he's physically challenged. So they, they carry him, and they lay him down in front of Jesus and Jesus says, be encouraged. And the second thing he says is, your sins are forgiven. He didn't say, be healed. He said, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because Jesus was going to the root of the problem. He was dealing with the cause, not the effect. We don't know what happened here, but somehow guilt had bound up this guy and paralyzed his life. I want you to understand this. This is very important. Not all suffering is caused by personal sin, okay? Not all suffering is caused by personal sin. Sometimes we suffer as individuals. Sometimes we innocently suffer because of somebody else's sin. When a baby is born as an addict, for example, uh, it's not the baby's fault. It's the, it's, it's the mother who was the, the crack addict's fault. So not all suffering is because of my sin. But let me say this. Most of our problems we bring on ourselves, would you agree with that? Uh, we do. In, in fact, I heard about a study of hospitals that said that nearly 50% of all patients in the hospitals today are there because of stress-related illness. And, and, and the first cause was guilt, and the second cause was bitterness. Guilt being what I've done to others and bitterness about what others have done to me. And, and if, if people could get rid of guilt and bitterness, a lot of their physical symptoms would be gone. 
Because, see, our bodies are not meant to handle guilt. Guilt is not a Christian emotion. Uh, It's an emotion that comes when we don't live the way God wants us to live. And and we weren't designed to handle guilt. And when you carry it and and carry it, it, it's going to show up in your body somehow. Most of the world is waiting to hear, that they're dying to hear three words. You are forgiven. They're waiting to hear that. And because they haven't heard it, they look for it in a bottle or they look for it in, uh, in pills or they look for it in relationships or hobbies or, or sports or overwork. So when they come home at night, they can just crash into bed and they don't have to think about how they really feel. And they try, they try everything and anything to get rid of their guilt. See, part of, uh, of the miracle here with this guy was that Jesus perceived what his real problem was. I'm sure that this guy, being a lifelong invalid, had tried every doctor there was. And probably uh, somebody had come to him and said, well, what you really need to do is you need to exercise more. You get, build up the strength in your legs and <laughs> your muscles. Or somebody else said, no, you, you need vitamin supplements. Um, and if, if you get the right nutrition, you'll not be paralyzed. And, and probably somebody said, no, what you need is to get your back adjusted. You know? uh, okay. Somebody else may have said, have you tried aromatherapy or, or crystals? <laughs> and, and on and on and on. But Jesus looks at me and says, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because he was bound up by guilt and nothing else was going to work. It's so typical. Uh, We we try everybody else before we try God. He's kind of our last resort. See, the real problem was he was paralyzed by the past. And when you are paralyzed by the past, you can't get on with the future. And you can't even enjoy today if if you've got a guilty conscience. Look at this verse again. Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Would you circle that word friend? Jesus called this guy his friend. <clears throat> Do you know what the religious leaders uh, who hated Jesus called Jesus? They called him the friend of sinners. And, and they thought that was really a put down. Oh, oh, Jesus, he's that friend of sinners. He hangs out with lowlifes and, and with immoral people and really evil, mean, bad, nasty people. Well, Jesus wore that as a badge of honor. He, he, he said, yeah, you're right. I'm a friend of sinners. I'm a friend of people who know how they've blown it. And what that says is no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you are valuable to God. And, and he calls you friend if you come to him honestly seeking, saying, God, help me. Help me change. Help me get rid of this, the hurts and the habits that mess up my life. And when you do that, he calls you friend. Because no matter what you've done, you're valuable. You matter to God. And notice the second thing is that Jesus, did, he did not publicly announce what this guy's sins were. <laughs> he didn't say, your sins are forgiven, which, by the way, are blah, blah, blah. No. He didn't announce that to the whole crowd. And, and there's a point here I want you to get. Jesus protects people's dignity. He, he didn't embarrass this guy. He, a lot of people think, if I come to Christ, I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to be embarrassed to death. No, you won't. You're going to be loved. Uh, Jesus always protected the dignity of the people who came to him who were hurting and in need. And then the third thing I want you to notice is that Jesus did not minimize the guy's guilt. Okay, he didn't say, oh, it's no big deal. He, he didn't minimize it. He eliminated it. And only God can do that. If you're looking for forgiveness, uh, you're looking for a clear conscience, there's only one place you can get it, and that's from God. No psychologist, no friend, no helper, no relative can give you that clear conscience. Only God has the power to forgive all the wrong things that you've done in your life. I I think I may have told you before about listening to a radio talk show that that had one of these radio psychologists on it, and uh, somebody called in, and this guy was just overwhelmed with guilt and shame and regret and remorse and, and hurtful memories, and he was just, just pouring it out. And he asked, how do I get rid of my guilt? And the radio psychologist said, well, you just have to live with it. No, <laughs> I know a better answer. You don't have to live with it. You don't have to live with your guilt. You can be forgiven. You can be free. That's what Jesus Christ died on the cross for. So you don't have to hold all that guilt in your life. 
Well, how does Jesus forgive? Well, on the back of your outline, I've, I've listed there, uh, the Bible says he forgives three ways. Number one, God forgives instantly. Now, that's not how we like to forgive. We like to make people suffer a little bit, right? You know, but God never makes us wait. He doesn't say, well, I'll think about it. No. In fact, the moment you ask, the instant you ask, there is no delay. You are instantly forgiven. You know, if my kids uh, hurt me or my wife, Darlene, uh, hurts me, I kind of want them to feel it for a little while, you know? You know, they may say, will you forgive me? And I'll say, eh. part of me wants to say, yeah, after you suffer a little bit. You know, you, know. you, know, you, just, you don't want to go, yeah, sure, of course, you're forgiven. But God doesn't do that. He instantly forgives. Now, here's the question. Should a Christian ever feel guilt? And the answer is yes, for about 10 seconds. Because that's about how long it takes to confess and, um, and repent and go, God, I admit it, I blew it, I sinned, please forgive me. Help me change. And that's it. You should not feel guilty after that. As I said, guilt is not a Christian emotion. There's a myth that says the guiltier I feel, the more spiritual I am. <laughs> no, the more miserable you are. But you're not more spiritual. God does not want you walking around carrying guilt all the time. Guilt is a lousy motivator. Um, and in fact, it tends to prolong the very thing that you're doing. Because when, when you feel guilty about something, you tend to say, well, that's just the way I am. And, and you do it some more. Uh, God doesn't want you walking around with guilt, so he forgives you the moment you ask. That's why you need to keep uh, short accounts with God. Whenever you blow it, you say, God, that was an unkind word. Please forgive me. Or God, that, that was, that, that was a, a, the wrong kind of thought. Uh, take that out of my mind. Please forgive me. And he forgives instantly. Secondly, he forgives completely. So you don't have to carry around unnecessary guilt. Look at this verse from Colossians 2. He has forgiven all your sins. He has utterly wiped out the evidence of broken commandments which always hung over our heads. And he has completely annulled it by nailing it to the cross. When Jesus Christ died uh, uh, for your sins, which ones did he include? All of them. All of them. Not only the ones you've already committed, but the ones you're going to commit today and the ones you're going to commit tomorrow and, and next year and uh, the rest of your life. He died for all of them completely. Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross so you can stop nailing yourself to the cross. He, he was hung up for our hang-ups. Uh, notice it says, wiped out. I, I call that super cleaner. Okay. They are wiped out. It's completely annulled. It, it's, it's like a bill that's been paid for. Once you've paid for a bill, do you have to worry about paying for it again? No. How long do you remember a bill that, you, that you've already paid? You go back and say, oh, oh, oh I paid that bill. No, you paid it off the moment you paid it off. It's, it's done. You forget it. And when Jesus died on the cross, he paid off all your sins. That's why it's such good news, folks. The world has yet to hear how, how good the good news really is. That Jesus Christ has already paid for everything I have ever done wrong. And everything I ever will do wrong. And he forgives instantly and he forgives completely. Now the question is, if God, the question is, if God forgives, shouldn't you also forgive? I mean, I mean if, you, if you keep bringing it up again over and over and over, it means you don't really believe that he forgave you in the first place. And in fact, let me say this to you. If you, if you feel guilty over something that you've already confessed and asked God to forgive, well, he did. So... Where do you think that guilt is coming from? Not from God. It's coming from Satan. It's coming from the devil. And that's really interesting because you know before you, before you commit a sin, Satan always minimizes it. He goes, ah, no big deal. Come on, everybody's doing it. Go ahead, do it. And he minimizes it. And the moment you commit it, he starts saying, oh, man, that's the biggest sin in the whole world. Um, 
You, you could never be right with God. You're, you know, you're just such a jerk. Forget it. You, you call yourself a Christian? Who do you think you are? You know, the Bible calls him the accuser of Christians. He makes, um, he makes no uh, big deal about it before, but after. Oh, you could never be forgiven for that. You know, forget, forget about praying. No, God forgives completely. And if he forgives and forgets, you should too. Now, if you don't understand this and really accept it in your heart, what happens is that every time something goes wrong in your life, you're going to start thinking, oh, God is getting even with me. You know, that thing I did back in 1991, <laughs> he's getting even with me now. No, he's not. Because all of the getting even was done on the cross. And God doesn't do double jeopardy. If Jesus paid for your sins, then you don't have to. If you accepted his gift. Does that make sense? This is good news. This is the gospel. He not only forgives instantly and completely, but number three, he forgives freely. Romans 3, 22 and 23 in the Living Bible says it like this. God says he will accept and acquit us, declare us not guilty, if we trust in Jesus Christ to take away our sins, no matter who we are or what we have been like. You will never be able to earn God's forgiveness. You will never deserve God's forgiveness. You, you, you can't work for God's forgiveness. You can't buy God's forgiveness. You can't bargain for God's forgiveness. All you need to do is accept it, and he gives it freely. We've been looking at these miracles of Jesus. We, we've looked at just a few of them, but let me tell you, the greatest miracle that Jesus ever does is forgiveness because it's your greatest need. It requires the greatest cost. Jesus died on the cross to make it possible. It produces the greatest benefits in your life, the best results. The greatest miracle you will ever have in your life is when you come to Jesus and say, Jesus Christ, be my Savior. Be my Lord and my Savior. And he forgives all the wrong in your life. And when you do that, it makes all the difference in the world. Jesus will calm your fears. He will confront your faults. And thirdly, he will challenge your faith. That's what he did with his paralytic. Uh, and he's going to do, if he's going to heal you in any area of your life, if you're going to see a miracle, he's going to ask you to do something that seems to you humanly impossible. He did it with this man. Uh, look at the Matthew uh, passage, chapter nine, uh, 9. Then Jesus said to the paralytic, Get up, take your mat, and go home. And the, mat got, the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God. Now, Jesus asked this man to do something he had never done before. He didn't even say, you're healed. He said, you're forgiven. Now, get up and take your mat and go home. And here's a guy who, who had to be carried everywhere. He may have been a paralytic all of his life uh, for more years than he can remember. Do you think there might have been a little fear in his life? What if I try to get up and I fall on my face? What if, I, what if I embarrass myself in front of this huge crowd standing around me? What if it doesn't work? <laughs> and there are all kinds of doubts and fears, and Jesus is asking this guy to do something that seemed to him humanly impossible. I'm, I'm sure you remember this, the, the old story of the guy who fell off the cliff and he caught on a branch. He's hanging on a branch and he's yelling for help and uh, uh, he's hundreds of feet below to be falling to his death and... and uh, Nobody's answering, and finally he looks to God. He looks up and says, God, help me. Please help me. And a voice comes out of the cloud and says, let go of the branch, and I will catch you. And he looks up again and says, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> you know, our paralytic is being asked to do something that he thought was impossible. He, he probably tried it many times before, and in and, and, and all those times in the past, it hadn't worked. Why should it work this time? Because this time Jesus was telling him to do it. He's challenging his faith. See, faith is something you do. It, it's more than thinking. It's more than believing. Faith is action. Faith is doing something God tells you to do even when you don't understand it. We talked about this last week. The Bible says, according to your faith, it will be done to you. And Jesus says, seven times in Scripture, your faith has healed you. 
Seven times he said that. And, and so this is the, the third thing. He challenges your faith. He'll ask you to do something you've never been able to do before. He may say, I want you to change jobs. He may, he, he may say, if you've got a relational problem, I want you to go and, and ask for forgiveness. And you say, oh, I can't do that. I, he, he may say, I want you to talk to a friend about Jesus. I always say, oh, I could, I could never talk to that guy about Christ. And he puts it on you. But here's the good news. Whatever God asks you to do, he always gives you the power to do it. God will never ask you to do something that he won't give you the power to see it through. But you must take the first step. That's where the miracle begins. That's where it happens. Once you've taken that step of faith. You see, in many ways, every one of us in this room are like this paralyzed man because we all have areas of our life uh, that are paralyzed. Where we're, we're, we're handicapped. Some of us are paralyzed by worry. Some, uh, we just can't get it out of our mind. Some of us are paralyzed by loneliness, and we just, we just feel lonely all the time. Some are, uh, are paralyzed by depression, and, and, and the world just seems so dark and bleak. Some of us are paralyzed by envy. We look around, and, and we see people with uh, nice things. We wonder, how come I can't have nice things like that? Some of us are paralyzed by anger. We have, we have a temper that keeps getting us in trouble. Uh, and we do it over and over and over. We get impatient. We spout off at the mouth, and, and then we regret what we've said. But the main thing that people get paralyzed by is the past. And, and we let hurts and regrets and memories dominate, uh, dominate us and paralyze us. And we can't enjoy the present. We, we can't move into the future because we're still caught in the past. Jesus wants to set you free. And that's the good news. But you have to stop making excuses. You have to stop saying, well, one of these days I'm going to give it all to Jesus. One of these days I'm going to give him every area of my life. Not just a little bit. I'm going to give it, give it all. And you've got to stop making excuses. You see, it really doesn't matter if Jesus uh, can calm your fears and heal your hurts and forgive all your sins if you don't do something in response to it. You've got to respond in faith. How do you show faith? Well, I listed three of them. They're on your outline. Number one, freely admit that I need help. Secondly, believe that Christ can and will help me. And thirdly, do what he tells me to do. These are the very three things that the paralyzed man did. He didn't hide behind his embarrassment or his fears. He, he came out in front of the crowd and said, I need help. He obviously believed that Jesus could help him or they wouldn't have taken the time to open the roof. And then he did what Jesus told him to do. Get up and take your mat and go home. What if he hadn't attempted to do what he thought was impossible? He would still be paralyzed. But he did it, and God healed him. Now, when it comes to healing, there's one thing that the, the, the Bible, in the Bible that God tells all of us to do that aids in our healing, whether it's relational, physical, spiritual, financial, and that is to tell other people about where we're struggling. Somehow God uses other people to encourage us. Look at James 5. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that God can heal you. That can happen in your small, uh, small group. But, but he says, get some close Christian friends and say, here's where I'm struggling. Some of you have been Christians for years and years, and yet you're still partially paralyzed because you continue to hold it all inside. And here's one of the things that God tells us to do. Confess it to each other and pray for each other. Do miracles still happen? Of course they do. God does them all the time, but he requires us to take a step in faith and do what he tells us to do. I want to close today by taking, uh, talking to three different groups here. Some of you are hurting. You're like the paralyzed person. You're paralyzed uh, by fear or worry or guilt or, or uh, conflicts in relationships, and you're hurting. You may look okay on the outside, but inside you're paralyzed. And I want to say to you, regardless of who you are or what you've done, Jesus Christ can heal you because his love is unconditional love. You can be forgiven. You can start over. Jesus can and will do it. 
The second group, others of you have already taken that step of faith. Um, you are a Christian, but you're still partially paralyzed because there's areas of your life where you haven't let go. You're still holding on to things you know aren't good for you. And, and God has been speaking to you and asking you to make a deeper commitment. And maybe a commitment to personal purity. Maybe a, a commitment to more involvement in ministry. Maybe a commitment of, of uh, using more of your resources. I don't know what it is, but he's asking you to demonstrate faith in your life for a miracle to happen. And then there's a third group of you, and that's the group of you who aren't in any pain at all. There aren't too many of you in that group. But you know somebody, a friend, a relative, a neighbor, a coworker. You know somebody who is paralyzed. And I'm asking you, what are you going to do about it? When are you going to bring them to Jesus? What do you, what, what, what do you, when are you going to care enough to bring them on a stretcher or whatever it takes to get them there? See, the other part of the story that... Uh, Really, one of my favorite parts is about the four friends. Um, I, I didn't spend, spend much time on them today, but I, I don't in any way want to minimize their importance. Without those four friends, uh, this man uh, wouldn't have had the miracle. They were concerned enough about their friend to do something about it. They had faith that Jesus could and would heal. They, they didn't just pray for their friend. They brought him to Jesus. They, they, they didn't let a difficult situation discourage them when they found the house so packed that they couldn't get in. They worked creatively together to get the job done, and they were willing to pay the cost. I mean, somebody had to pay for the roof repairs, right? So here's the question. What will you do to get your friend to Jesus? Amen.